Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to the Stewart Heritage Museum November presentation. We've got a couple things to go over tonight before we get to the presentation. Uh, first off, I want to make sure everyone is acutely aware that on December 2nd, we'll have an open house at the museum from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. We'll have light refreshments. We'll have tours going on. Uh, we should have a, a trolley tour around Stewart. Uh, and at that time, we will be raffling off the basket you see over there. Uh, I can't go into details, all the things that are in there, but I know we've got donations from uh, Rare Earth here in Stewart, downtown Stewart. We've got stuff from uh, this, from the museum, from uh, Maria's restaurant, from uh, Stimmel's, uh, the Stimmel family. Uh, there's very interesting stuff in there. And you know, we are gonna get a list of what's in there so we can let you know what you're winning. <laughs> uh, but I encourage you to participate with that. You do not have to be present to win. We'll draw that uh probably around uh two o'clock on december uh second also you know december 1st the city of stewart's having their uh christmas parade down east ocean it amazes me every year we're, we participate in that and see all the people out there along the roadway it just it's fascinating Are we going? down to business this is our annual meeting. And at our annual meeting, we elect one half of our board. Uh, they're elected for a two year term. And so we alternate each year with <coughs> members of the board. Uh, the board members who are up for consideration this year were Rhonda Glass, Barbara Hodat, and John Layton. They've all agreed to continue serving on the board uh, I noted on the ballot that if there's others who would like to participate in the board, we'd love to have you come on board. <coughs> I'd ask that you come by the museum, sign up as a volunteer, because obviously the board work is volunteer work, and uh, <coughs> we can go from go forward from that point. But right now, I would entertain a motion to uh, accept the nominees to accept unanimously the nominees presented for reinstatement. Is there such a motion? I have a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. I have a second. I call the question. Uh, well, first, is there any discussion? Anyone have a question about what I'm doing? Okay, I do. I'm keep coming back. Uh, all those in favor of accepting the three nominees uh, to continue to serve on the board signify put your hand up. Anybody opposed to this unanimous acceptance? Thank you. Now I don't have to count the ballots. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, I told her to put her hand up. <laughs> she wants to count the ballots. That's the business side of it tonight. Uh, what y'all came for wasn't to hear me talk about the business. It's to uh, hear our guest speaker tell us about his experiences here in the waters of uh, the Treasure Coast and throughout the, uh, throughout the Caribbean, as I understand. Uh, Thomas Guidus uh, is a native Floridian, lives out of down that community down south of us here, Jupiter. Jupiter, yeah. we, we, we accept that. We still accept him in the neighborhood. Uh, but he's got extensive experience in archaeological findings and uh, treasure diving, and I'm going to let him tell you about it rather than me try to tell you about it. Yes? Thank you. Thank you for the honor of this. Um, thank everybody for coming out tonight and especially to Gloria for inviting me to speak. Um, as they said, I am a native Floridian. I was born in the Orlando area and um, 
For the past 32 years, I've worked as a historic shipwreck salver. And not only in Florida, I started on the 1715 fleet back in 1991, uh, first working for a diver. And then the next year, 1992, I got my own subcontract from Mel Fisher, started working for Mel. And I've worked um, 1715 fleet in some capacity every year for the last 32 years. Um, I've also worked on some other wrecks, much older, uh, the 1618 wreck, which is off uh, Bureau Beach. There's a Spanish galleon from 1570 or so off of Juneau Beach, which is what caused me to move down here in 2008. Um, the Jupiter wreck, which is 1659. And I've worked some wrecks up in North Carolina too, and then also on the Gulf Coast. Uh, but tonight we're gonna talk about the lost treasure fleet of 1715. We'll do a little bit of the backstory on it. And it's kind of done chronologically. Um, I actually ended up with about 153 slides and then realized I'm not gonna have time to <laughs> speak on all of them, but I'll try to get them up on the screen real quick and go through them and, and then we'll go from there. Um, also, there's some artifacts if you all wanna look after we're done at the artifacts. Um, some of these are very old and unconserved, so please just look, but don't touch. And there's some real treasure up here in this display case. So let's get started. So we got to do a little bit of backstory about the 1715 fleet. And it actually goes all the way back to 1701. Charles II was the ruler of Spain. And when he died, he had no heirs. So they named Philip as the new king of Spain, but Philip was of French descent. So it started a, actually a series of wars in Europe. It was called the War of Spanish Succession. It ran from 1701 to 1714. And you had France and Spain on one side, you had England, the Netherlands, and Austria on the other. And um, it was finally resolved towards the end of 1713, although it kind of carried on for a few years. And then Philip V, as he was called, had two wives. His first wife was Mary Louisa. He married her in 1701. She died, and then uh, she died in 1714, and then later in 1714, he married Elizabeth Farnese, who was the Duchess of, of Parma. Um, and that's kind of like uh, what started a lot of the interest in the 1715 fleet is because for the new queen, they sent uh, dispatch boats. The 1715 fleet had already left for the New World in 1713. <laughs> The new queen came in 1714, so they sent some really quick dispatch boats over um, trying to get jewels for the new queen. So that kind of plays into the, the story too later on. Um, when the fleet left Europe, it was called the West Indies Fleet. It actually com comprised two fleets, the New Spain Fleet, which sailed and went to Veracruz, Mexico, and then the Tierra Firma Fleet, which went to Cartagena, which was uh, in Colombia. Oops. <clears throat> And there's kind of a map that shows you where they went. They got to the New World. Um, they actually uh, had a boat that broke off and went to Puerto Rico to get tobacco. And then the ships went to Veracruz of Mexico and down to Cartagena. These are some of the items that we see listed on the manifest. We actually have the ship's manifest from 1715. They have been deciphered for us. And a lot of the things we see were things like uh, I guess I'm pronouncing this correctly, cochineal, which was a type of uh, red pigment a dye. It was actually an insect. Um, indigo, I have a small piece of indigo up here. They found some uh, bells of indigo on one of the wreck sites back in the 1980s, and the divers got into these bells. I don't know how they made it through all these years, and it turned the divers blue. They were actually blue for a couple of days because it turned the water around them blue. Um, they brought back tobacco, cocoa bean, logwood, which is actually a type of a flowering tree to make a black dye, and cassava. So those were some of the things that they were bringing back. And then of course, the precious metals like copper. There's some crude copper ingots. Of course, everybody <laughs> likes the silver. Those are clean silver pieces of eight there. And then the gold coins, the gold escudos. Um, the copper mainly came from Mexico. The silver was from Potosi, which is a, a mountain of silver um, in Peru. Now it's in Bolivia. And then the gold came from Hispaniola, Domin Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Peru, Colombia, Mexico. And then they had various mints in the New World. Uh, Bogota, Potosi, Lima, and Mexico City. And then also they had the Manila gallons. The Manila gallons would sail from the Philippines and China, across the Pacific Ocean. They would land in Acapulco, Mexico, 
all of that cargo was loaded onto mules and then they'd take the mules overland to Veracruz and then they would get loaded on the ships and then the ships would go to, to Havana and uh, back to Spain. They also had jade, gunpowder, silk, spices, ivory. And so we come to July 31st, 1715, the fleet. There's 12 vessels in the fleet, 11 Spanish ships. There's one French ship that sailed with them. They're sailing up the coast of Florida and they hit a massive hurricane on July 31st. I'm sorry that slide's so small, but that shows you where the wrecks are. There's actually six wrecks of the 11 Spanish shipwrecks. <clears throat> Only six of them have been found. Of the six, one of them is an archeological site that the state of Florida made, that's off of Pepper Park. The, the um, state of Florida believes that the wreck is the Urca de Lima. A lot of treasure salvers don't agree with that. They think you know, it was misidentified. But anyway, it starts up around um, Sebastian, the cabin wreck, and then Vero Beach is Corrigan's. Also Vero Beach, you have uh, the Rio Mar wreck, Sandy Point wreck. Um, then the Urca de Lima, which is at Pepper Park, and then at Fort Pierce, they call it the Gold Wreck or the Colored Beach Wreck. And they have worked those wrecks continuously over the last 70 years. They're still, still finding gold and treasure and artifacts off of them. So those are the locations of them. They're not a secret. There's stuff on the internet. You can find the GPS coordinates for all them. So after the ships wrecked, uh, the Spanish had various methods to recover their treasure. They used drag chains, they would actually drag a chain between two boats and uh, try and hook onto something. They used grapnels, they sent down free divers, and they even had an early version of a diving bell. They would lower the bell into the water, it would trap the air into it, and the divers could go up, get a fresh, you know, breath of air, and then dive back down. They didn't really use a diving bell in the 1715 fleet wreck, though, because the water was so shallow. Most of these wrecks are in water 30 feet or less and the majority of the stuff comes from about 15 feet of water or less. Um, the Spanish worked the wrecks between 1715 and 1718, and they recovered an estimated 40 to 50% of the lost treasure. And when I say 40 to 50% of the lost treasure, that's the manifested treasure. We have the manifest, we know what each ship carried, but they were known for carrying contraband, usually another 50% in contraband treasure. So. We have no idea what's left out there. Uh, we do know uh, ships like the one at, uh, at um, Sebastian, the cabin wreck, there's 300 chests of silver coins missing. Each of those chests holds 3,000 coins. So there's 900,000 coins approximately that haven't been recovered yet. So there's still a lot out there. But the Spanish were actually very successful. Um, just as an example, in 1733, just what is that, 18 years later, a whole fleet of ships went down in the Florida Keys, the 1733 fleet, there were about 22 of them. When the Spanish were done salvaging that fleet, they actually recovered more treasure than was listed on the manifest. And the King of Spain was not happy about that. There were court marshals and inquiries, and I'm sure some people went to, to jail because of that. Um, but they recovered approximately 40 to 50% of the treasure. There's a diver going down, they would take a heavy rock that would pull them quickly down to the bottom and then they would attach a rope to whatever they could find. I think that's from National Geographic. That's uh, a friend of mine, that's diver Mike Perna, and he's actually holding one of those grapnels that we were talking about to hook into a box of the treasure. So we recovered one of the grapnels um, on one of the shipwreck sites. Um, as I mentioned in 1713, the War of Spanish Success had ended, and what happened is you had all these seafarers, all these sailors that were working for the government at the time. They were called privateers, and they had permission from the government to raid um, the enemy, the merchant ships of the enemy. But when the war ended and there were peace, now you had all these guys that were out of work, and a lot of them went on account, which meant they became pirates. So about the time when the 1715 fleet wrecked, that started the golden age of piracy. And they actually had some pirates come up from Jamaica. I don't know if I have another slide for that. Here we go. So pirate Henry, Henry Jennings and Charles Vane, they came up with about three or four ships, about 150 men at night. 
They landed between the two major camps of the uh, 1715 fleet, General Rivia's Capitana and his Almiranta, and they ended up taking about 350,000 pesos of treasure um, on that raid. What's interesting, if they had been about two weeks earlier, they would have recovered four million because they just had, they had a storehouse about where the McLaurin Museum is today. And uh, they had just shipped four million pesos back to Havana that they had salvaged. So they, uh, they missed the big haul, but they still got quite a bit of treasure. That was in, uh, that was in the, the end of 1715 when they did that. Um, that's an actual um, deciphered document. I don't know if you can read any of that, but it is talking about the pirates on there. It says the Palmer DAs, that's circled in that area. The Palmer DAs is, again, it's fashion area. And um, Jack Haskins, Bob Marks, and uh, some other people, other people that deciphered these old documents back in the 1960s. And I have about 200 pages of documents like this that talk about the salvage and the shipwrecks. So this is a book that my friend um, Bob Weller wrote, Sunken Treasure on Florida Reefs. And he basically tells the story that I just told about the sailing and the sinking of the fleet and the pirates and the salvaging. And then he used a phrase, he said, after that, the story of the 1715 fleet disappeared into the musty pigeonholes of time. I have no idea what a musty pigeonhole is, <laughs> but that always bothered me. It's like, no, that can't be right. Cause he picks up in the book after this, and then he picks up 1960, Kip Wagner and Real 8. And I'm like, no, there had to be more than that. And there was quite a bit more. In fact, the story of the 1715 fleet probably never went away. It was probably passed on from sailor to sailor, generation to generation. And um, we found that as we're salvaging these wrecks, there's a lot of other shipwrecks in the area from the 1700s and 1800s. We kind of suppose that maybe they were coming in to, to work on these wrecks. They call it fishing on the wrecks and maybe became shipwrecks themselves. So that's Skip Wagner. I said, no, not yet, Kit. We're not ready for you. This is an actual newspaper article from the year 1716. This is the London Gazette. And it talks specifically about the 1715 fleet. They were waiting for, uh, you know, you had all the merchants in Europe that lost money on that because all the shipwrecks and they were waiting for Spain to finish the salvage so they could get paid for the goods that they shipped over. So that's a uh, actual newspaper. Here's another one. It says letters from Cadiz, which is in Spain, say that about three quarters of the plate and money, plate is just the word plata, silver, the plate and money, the galleons that were sunk have been saved already. A great deal of cochineal and indigo, we talked about that, were taken out but damaged. So it was in the newspapers all over Europe at the time. <clears throat> and then in uh, 1774, there was Bernard Romans, he was a surveyor and a photographer and a naturalist. If you remember, Florida had a British period. I think it was in the 17, who knows the date, 1760s or so was the British period. And so when uh, Britain had Florida, they had to map Florida. Spanish didn't share any other maps or intelligence with the British. So he came down here and he surveyed South Florida. And while he was down here, he knew that there were still masts from the fleet still visible above the water. So we're talking 50, 60 years after the fleet sunk, um, you could still see wreckage above the water of those shipwrecks. And then he also said, while well, walking the strand, repeatedly found pistarines and devil pistarines, which are silver coins. So these surveyors in 1774, as they were walking the beach, were finding um, shipwreck treasure on the beach. And then also he made a map, and it's really interesting, on this map, he noted, it says, opposite this river perished the Admiral commanding the plate fleet 1715, the rest of the fleet 14 in number between this and the bleach yard. Um, he was off in the, in the count of the ships, it was actually 12. And uh, the bleach yard, if you're familiar with the Stewart area, uh, Mount Elizabeth, and there's Mount Pisgah, and, and on the west shore, there's a lot of high hills in there. That's what they're referring to as a bleach yard. They were just high hills. Back then, they were, there was no vegetation on them. They were just sand dunes, and the Spanish could see those out at sea, and they used that as a landmark. And 
that's just listening to some of the wrecks that are on the bed. I think this is from the yeah, map that you showed me in the museum. Um, honestly, that's probably a third or the fourth of, of what's out there. I'm looking at these and I can think of a, a bunch that aren't even listed on here. Uh, Mel Fisher says that there's a shipwreck every quarter mile between you know, Sebastian and Key West, and you're probably right. Uh, but like I said, uh, we think that a lot of these uh, shipwrecks may have been salvaging the 1715 fleet. If you look at some of them and you look at where these ships originated and where their destination was, they never should have been anywhere on the east coast of Florida. So it looks like some of them made little stops to, uh, to fish for treasure. Um, here is a story from 1899 and what I'm just trying to build up here is that again the story of the 1715 fleet probably never went away it didn't end in, in 1718 and then pick up again in 1960 it was always in the in the consciousness of people it was in the newspapers here this talks about it um, this is the newspaper this is the St. Lucie County Tribune from 1906 it says Captain By goes to the scene of the wreck this is the one that's at Fort Pierce off of Pepper Park um, he salvaged some cannons from there, so they knew about it in 1906. Um, this was an article from 1965, but it references 1911. And this is Stedman Parker. And, and to me, Stedman Parker was the true founder of the 1715 fleet shipwrecks. He actually applied for leases from the state of Florida back in 1950, uh, 10 years before Real Aid did. Uh, but he says in 1911, when I was 14, I was with my father, and Arthur Kreigel and Ed Futch, some of you guys may know the Futch family, they've been around here forever on the Treasure Coast, and they located one of the floater wrecks. In later years, with the geologist's help, I determined that it lay at the site of a closed inlet. So even way back in 1911, uh, the locals knew about these wrecks. That's 1928, they recovered a bunch of uh, cannons off the old Fort Pierce Inlet, again, which is at Pepper Park. That's where the original Fort Pierce Inlet was. You can see they have like an old Model T pickup truck there and they're loading cannons on it. If you've ever been to Fort Pierce, they have some, in one of the parks there, they have some really um, bad cannons and bad shapes. There's just hardly anything left. And that's, unfortunately, they didn't conserve them when they, when they pulled them out of the ocean. You, can, you can't do that. You've got to conserve them immediately. But that's 1928. 1932, Wabasso Beach treasure. Um, they had found cannons, relics in Wabasso Beach. So again, it was still in the newspaper, 1939 Bureau Beach Press Journal. A guy named Joe Conway, who was a local guy, recovered cannons, artifacts, gold coins. It's hard to tell in that picture, but they're actually looking at a big piece of shipwreck wreckage right there. So there's still quite a bit of wood left from these galleons, even into the 1930s and so. Uh, 1940, Spanish vessel washed ashore south of Sebastian Inlet. Gold and copper coins and bronze cannons were found near the wreckage, which is interesting, the bronze cannons. In 1941, Charles Higgs, who was kind of like a avocational archaeologist, came down here and started looking around on the beach. And he was finding things like pieces of eight, Chinese pottery, and other items and this ended up being in the area of the McClarty Museum and again that was one of the salvage camps they had several of them but that was the main salvage camp of the 1715 fleet um, not only did the survivors you know have to live there until they were rescued but then you had three years of, of men coming to salvage it and um, that's where they lived so he found quite a bit there in 1942 he published this was in the Florida Historical Quarterly the Spanish contacts with the A's Indians, and again, he talks quite a bit about uh, 1715 wrecks in there. And there's a photo of some of the wreckage on the beach. It's a big piece of wreckage there. And that's just two miles south of Sebastian Inlet. All right, this is 1950, and this is actually the lease that Stedman Parker took out um, through the state of Florida. Um, through the uh, Florida Internal Improvement Fund, December 12, 1950. And if you look on there, it gives you the actual um, section, township, and range. And you can go online. They have free apps that you can go online, websites you can go to, and you can plug in that information. It'll show you exactly where that is. But this one was just south of the cabin wreck. 
it says Brevard County at that time that area was Brevard County and then after they built the um, bridge over the Sebastian Inlet I think they changed it and Brevard County ended up on the north side of Sebastian Inlet then anything after that was Indian River County but at that time it was Brevard County so in 1950 Stedman Parker actually took out a lease um, for it unfortunately they were now <laughs> in boats working the shipwreck site they brought in the big crane like that with a bucket and they were swinging they they dredged sand out and they built a little fake pier of sand and they went out there and they tried to salvage a shipwreck using a bucket and they weren't very successful doing it that way that's from 1951 that's the miami herald right there and that guy right there he's got an old metal detector and mine detector he's sifting some of the sand that they're pulling up from offshore um, that wasn't a very good way to do it there's Stedman Parker right there going over some old maps. Um, this is a, a, another avocational archeologist. His name is Homer Cato. You may have heard of Homer Cato. He found quite a bit of treasure on the beach and he also found some stuff inland on the, uh, on the Sebastian River. And he supposed that after the pirates raided the Spanish camp there on the beach, that they made another camp on the other side of the Indian River on the mainland about um, where the Sebastian River Bridge is today. There's a, a, a big bluff there on the south side and he thinks that they had a garrison on, um, on that side of the river just to give them a little bit of extra protection, get everything off the beach. Uh, another 1955 article, they found some silver wedges there. That Jack Carr this is 1955 Jack Carr, treasure salver Art McKee came up from the Florida Keys and they salvaged and got a pile of cannonballs there. That all came off the Sandy Point wreck. Um, and they salvaged a bunch of cannons too. I think about 16 cannons or so. So again, this is all pre, you know, real eight and, and treasure salvers. And then here we go. Here's a picture of Kip Wagner examining some artifacts from the fleet. There's Mel Fisher with a big pile of gold coins. So now we're up to the, the 1960 to the 1963 era. When Real 8 started, when Kip Wagner started Real 8, um, most of those guys were just part time. He hired a lot of guys that worked for um, NASA and for Cape Kennedy and, you know, like Lou Woolian um, from the Air Force, Harry Cannon, Dan Thompson, guys like that. And they only worked part time. They would find a lot of treasure, but they just didn't have time to do a full time operation. In 1963 or so, Mel Fisher was coming. He was from California. He was coming through Cal uh, through Florida to go down and work a wreck in the Caribbean. And he stopped by to see Kip Wagner. He said, "Listen, Kip, you know you have more wrecks down here than you will ever be able to work in a lifetime. I have a group of men. How about letting us come down and work for you? We'll work for a year for free. If we don't find anything, we'll just call it quits." Um, so they had an agreement they started a mel had a company called universal salvage i think they have a slide of the actual agreement between him and kip and so mel and his team worked for free for a year and they were getting almost to the end of that year it was like 360 days or something and they hit that big haul off the gold wreck at fort pierce i think it was over a thousand something gold coins at the time so uh that cemented their agreement and they worked together for seven more years and that's kind of a, a blend of both treasure salvers and real aid. That's Kip right there. There's Mel Fisher. Uh, that's Mo Molinar. Mo Molinar was a, uh, a boat mechanic that Mel picked up from Panama. He was a stowaway. He brought it back to the United States. Mel told me he would take him to Disney World in California. So Mo said, sure. <laughs> and they worked with him. Mo ends up being probably one of the greatest treasure divers that ever lived. I worked for Mo. I worked off his boat, the Virgilona. And the guy was just incredible. He was still diving for treasure into his, uh, into his 70s. He's since passed away. So that's a cool little photo of both uh, Real 8 and uh, Treasure Sowers. There's another picture of them. Uh, that's Bob Moran. Bob is still alive. He's about 92 years old. He's a good friend of mine. Um, there's Mo again. There's Mel's wife, Dio, and some more of the Treasure Salver guys. There's Mo coming up with a silver disc, solid silver disc that weighed about seven pounds. That's Mel Fisher with him. There's Kip Wagner. That is a almost intact 
chests of silver coins that they found on the cabin wreck. So that's what one of the chests looked like. All the coins in there are kind of fused together into a clump, uh, but it's still got the bottom, one side and one of the other sides. But uh, I think they found two of those. But back then they were finding so many coins that the divers used to say you could, you could rake them up with a rake on the bottom. And they used to tell the divers, don't, don't go down there and pick up the individual coins, look for the clumps of coins. They were finding so many um, that they stopped counting them. They used to weigh them. I think I have a slide here of them and these big burlap bags that they would take to the bank and they would just weigh them. They'd figure out how many coins there were to a pound or whatever, and they stopped counting them. There were too many to count. So that's an intact chest they found. There's them bringing it up off the bottom. There's a clump of corroded pieces of eight. There's the burlap bag <coughs> a bunch of <coughs> sitting there in the floor. Um, that's Tommy Gore. Tommy Gore was a state of Florida field agent. Back then when they first started this program, um, the state required that field agent be on every boat. Um, later on, it got to the point where they had too many uh, subcontractors and, and leaseholders that the state couldn't afford to put an agent on every boat. So Tommy became like the main guy and he would just run around out there in a speedboat and check on all the boats. He kind of went on the honor system. And then sometime in the early 2000s, I forget, they did away with having a state agent at all out there. And uh, Tommy actually retired and became a treasure hunter after that. And he knew all the good spots because he worked for the state for 30 something years. And Tommy's still alive. He lives in he lives in Georgia. There's Dio Fisher with a, a pewter plate. Um, there's Mel with some of the thousand gold coins that he found. He's laying there. That's his wetsuit with all the coins on him. There's Dio with some more gold coins. There were actually two big finds. There's the one that Treasure Sellers found, and then also Real Eight found another thousand something coins. Um, I think the very next year again on the same wreck. That's the wreck down at Fort Pierce. Um, there's some, uh, that's the dragon whistle that they found that was actually found on the beach. Kip Wagner's nephew, Rex Stalker, found that on the beach. It's interesting, if you find it on the beach, you get to keep it. They didn't have to divide it with the state or anything like that. So um, they kept that. They actually traded some shares of real estate stock to, um, to Rex for that. So Rex became a member of Real Aid, and they ended up selling that at auction for fifty thousand dollars back in the time. It's probably worth. It's probably priceless today. But that's called a dragon whistle. It actually had like a solid gold. It had like an earwax spoon on it. You could blow into it. It was like a a bosun's whistle. That chain is an eleven foot gold chain. Um, so that was found on the beach uh, there at Sebastian Inlet. And then you've got some silver coins, and then some Kangxi porcelain china. I'm sorry, so that? Why do they all become one cup? Well, they were usually carried in, uh, as I showed you, chests like that. And the salt water action on silver causes them to kind of fuse together. Sometimes they were put in individual small bags and then put into a chest. And we've even seen the silver, the silver coins with the imprint of the burlap bag and the coins themselves from sitting that way for, for 300 years. Um, this is uh, Bruce Ward. And there were two guys named Ward and Neiman, Bruce Ward and Don Neiman. And they had actually been finding treasure down at Fort Pierce. Um, they're local guys long before Real Eight came along. And they cut an agreement with Kip Wagner to show him where the wreck site was. And they put him on the wreck site. So these were some of the original guys that were finding coins. Um, This ties in locally here to Martin County. The Martin County Historical Society actually had lease from the state of Florida to look for shipwrecks in this area. Their original lease was for a mile north of the, um, of the House of Refuge and a mile south. And then I think they expanded that, but there were people that uh, can still believe that one of the 1715 wrecks uh, made it all the way down here, somewhere around St. Lucie Inlet. And we believe that for a few reasons, one is the ship that wrecked in that area, they actually did a reading at the time. They did it with a quadrant and they uh, plotted their, their location is around 2715, which kind of puts it in that area. It's not up where uh, the state thinks it is at Fort Pierce. 
The other reason they think it's there is because uh, they said we are the southernmost wreck. They actually wrote letters to the King of Spain when they were trying to get the, the salvage boats to come to their wreck site first, and they said we are the southernmost wreck. Um, so again, it couldn't be the wreck at Fort Pierce uh, because there's one south of that. Uh, that's Bob Marks, Sir Robert Marks. In 1968, he was made um, the researcher for Real 8. And Bob went on to salvage shipwrecks. By that time, he already had. He had already excavated the sunken city of Port Royal, um, wrecks all over the world, California. Um, and when Real 8 started, this is what they were using. They were using two methods to search. They were using an airlift, and what an airlift does is it pumps compressed air down to the end of a, a bigger tube, and as the air rises up the tube, it creates a suction. Now, you can only use an airlift in about 20 feet of water or deeper. It has to be deep enough that there's enough um, power, you know, as the air goes up for it to expand and create a suction. If they were in shallower water, what they did is they pumped water down into the pipe and as the, as the water went up the pipe, and again, it created suction. So they used a water dredge or an airlift. And as you can imagine, it was really slow going. Um, by the way, this is not on the Treasure Coast. The water does not look that clear on the Treasure Coast. But that's what they used. It was a very uh, slow method to excavate the bottom. And they needed to excavate because most of these ships after 300 years are under anywhere from two to eight, 10, 15 feet of sand. You gotta move a lot of sand to get to the bottom. And then I think that's one of the real eight boats. I think you can see the one of the dredge pipes on the boat right there. So they were using that method. And then Mel Fisher came along and he invented something called the mailbox. And they called it the mailbox because that's the original one. That's what it looked like. And I have a, I have a little boat here. My son made this for me, so I have to show this off. <laughs> um, but this is what it looks like now. Here's the boat, and they have this device in the back. It looks like a tube. And this is how it is when it's raised and when you're riding up. And when you get to the wreck site and you anchor the boat, this thing lowers down, and that end goes directly behind the propeller. And all you do is you just gun the engine, and it takes all your prop wash, and it directs it down towards the bottom, and it removes all that sand. And it does it 100 times more than what those airless are that you're using. Um, when Mel invented this, the, he actually invented it to try and get clear water down to the bottom. Um, the visibility here on the Treasure Coast is terrible. If you have six foot visibility, that's considered really good visibility. But a lot of times there's no visibility. We call it rail diving. You know, you, you get something in your hand, you gotta hold it right up to your face mask just to see what's in your hand. So Mel invented this to try and get clear water down to the bottom, but he discovered it moved a lot of sand too. So. Um, they call it the mailbox, or they call them blowers, or blasters, or dusters. Um, there's my friend Terry Armstrong. There's one of the original uh, blowers. So when the boat is out on site, you have to do a three-point anchorage. You have an anchor off the bow, and then you have to do two off the stern. And then you lower your blowers down, and you blow a hole. If you want to move the boat, all you do is let out on one line on the stern and pull in on the other, and you can move it over six feet you blow another hole. You try and connect your hole so you're not missing any of the bottom. Or you can let out on the, on the bow line and pull in on the stern lines and you can move the boat forward. So you can go forwards, backwards, left or right um, over the course of the day. And you try and connect all your holes so you don't miss any of the bottom. There's an illustration again of how the mailboxes work. There's a blower being lowered on the back of the creep. That's what they look like in the water. Some boats have two blowers on them, depending on the props, some have one. There's a model of the Virgilona, shows you what it looks like. There's a diver underwater with his metal detector. He's going down into the, the hole that the blower just blew. The metal detectors are like these that we have here. He's actually clipped to your, to your BC. And then you put your earphone under, under your mask, and this thing just waves around. You wave this around the bottom. These are very sensitive. This will find a silver coin under about 18 inches of sand. So these are pretty powerful. This is about a, I think these things sell for about $1,500 today. That one's a little bit older, but they are expensive. Um, there's a boat out at sea blowing a hole, so you can see it kicks up a lot of sediment as they're digging holes. 
that's at the Jupiter wreck. The water's really clear, but you can actually see the excavations that it's made. So that boat has been pulled forward, backwards to the side, and it's digging holes through the sand. You have to go all the way down to bedrock. That's where all the artifacts are. Mm -hmm. After 300 years, the coins and the artifacts kind of just percolate through the sand and they don't stop until they hit something, until they hit reef or until they hit the hard pan. Uh, that's me on the creep, the blower on the creep. Those are some big blowers right there on Bell Fisher's boat. Those are down in the keys, but it gives you the idea. Um, you know, there is a limit to how deep you can go with those things though. Um, you can work them really shallow water, you can go down. Um, those boats will probably dig in about 60 feet of water. In fact, the Atocha is in 55 feet of water and that's why they have vessels that big. Um, if we get to areas that are too deep for the blowers to work, we use little things like that. That's actually a, a dive propulsion vehicle. It's supposed to pull you through the water, but we just turn around and, and use them to blow <laughs> the holes in the sand. Um, back in the day before GPS, we had to plot our, our where we were working, where we were finding treasure. We had to keep log sheets for the state of Florida and also for ourselves. And we had to figure out where our positioning was. The state of Florida and all the wreck sites along the Treasure Coast um, erected these beach markers. They were orange signs. Some of them, a wreck site would have letters. Another wreck site may have numbers. And they were spaced certain distance apart and they were all plotted. And when we were offshore, we had to use a sextant. And I have one right here to figure our position. Now, a, a sextant is a, a, a navigational tool, a celestial navigational tool. And normally you use it like this. You look at it and you're sighting a, a star and you're figuring out your position, but we use it like this. You turn it on your side. And let's say there's a beach marker there, a beach marker there, a beach marker there. We're offshore in the boat and you had to go like that. And this thing slid right here and there's numbers on here. And we would figure out our position um, where we were working. The state gave you a nice little data recorder card if you, if you uh, pass the test. There's some more guys taking readings. And then they did away with that, I think around 1996 or so. Uh, GPS, differential GPS came into play. Um, that at the bottom is the base map. So we had these big maps that we had to plot our hits on. At the end of the year, we would plot all of our hits. That's a green cabin wreck off of Vero Beach. But you can see there's the C marker. They had the markers. And then you had to use a three-arm protractor and plot your position on these maps. And those got turned into the state. Um, the only thing about this system is I can never figure out how to get back to that spot again in my life. I don't know how other salvers did it. It was useless to me. I kept good readings, but I never knew how to get back to the, to the same spot. So thank God for GPS. That's what GPS looks like. Those are some units that you could, you know, on your boat. And then that's a little handheld unit. And <clears throat> this is the Capitano. That's a nice setup because where the blowers are, right above it, they have that. That's the GPS antenna. So they know exactly where the hole is that they're digging. And those things with differential are accurate to about six feet. They're, they're pretty accurate. So you can get back to the same spot again and again and again. Um, so here we are in the 1970s. This was a shipwreck remains found at Corrigan's. 1970s, there's a whole galleon anchor that was found on the beach in the 70s. Um, that's my friend Alex. Alex lives here in Hope Sound. When he found that, that is the biggest gold artifact found on the 1715 fleet. He wasn't a shipwreck salver. Him and some friends were scuba diving in Vero Beach looking for lobster. And he found that thing. They didn't know what it was at first. They didn't even know it was gold. They thought maybe it was bronze. As they were driving back up towards Melbourne, they were holding out the car window. <laughs> you know, like you do your hand out the window, and they're doing it with that. Um, the state of Florida took that. Um, they did not have a lease. It was in the water. It technically belongs to the state of Florida. The state of Florida, in return, they, uh, Alex was with two other guys. So I think between the three of them, the state of Florida gave them about $225,000 worth of gold coins. I don't know what that came out to. They probably long cashed in those coins or whatever, but it was just a beautiful find. Um, it's in Tallahassee in the RA Gray building. Um, Alex is still researching that. They think it came originally from the Orient. They think it's a glove tray. It was actually for aristocracy. When you would come in, you would take off your gloves and you would lay it on your solid gold tray. <laughs> How much does that weigh? Um, 
Honestly, I, I don't know. It, it's got to be a few pounds. That's solid gold. Um, Alex wrote a book about it. Again, he's still researching it. There's his book. So uh, good for him. That was neat. That's John Brandon and Debbie Smith looking at a bunch of, uh, you can see the gold bars there, gold coins. Look at that date on there, July 23, 1985. It says treasure divers hit gold at second site. The second site being off of Vero Beach. Three days earlier on July 20th, they hit the mother load of the Atocha, $400 million shipwreck. And then here in Vero Beach, they found another million dollars or so. So Mel was having a really good month in July of 1985. Um, there's Mo Molinar and Harold Holden. Um, in the 1980s, I think Mo found something like, a lot of these pictures that you see in here are the gold coins that Mo found. I think over 800 gold coins, again, at that same shipwreck at, uh, at Fort Pierce gold wreck or the color beach track. There's some more incredible jewelry and uh, artifacts. There's Bob Marks and Mo looking at some of the treasure that they found. There's some rings that Bob Weller found again from the gold wreck, the color beach track at Fort Pierce. Some beautiful, beautiful rings in there. Those all came up through the 1980s. Uh, that's cool, that's an intact chest. If you look at that right there, there's an intact chest that Mo found. They thought it was a chest of coins, got a lot of publicity. They opened it live on the news and it was full of split shot, which are like a type of, uh, they're like musket balls that are joined together and you would fire them and they would kind of spin as they came out of the musket, but it was full of split shot. It was not the silver coins they were hoping for. There's my friend, Kim Farrell and Roy Volker with a bunch of coins. Those came from the cabin wreck at Sebastian. And then this is where I come in, 1991. So, uh, I, like I said, I started working as a diver um, for a guy, and we didn't even have a boat back then. You were supposed to have a, a boat and everything. We were using an inflatable boat and diving off the beach, which Mel and Taffy Fisher were not very happy about. Um, we would get in the water at uh, Turtle Trail. I don't know if you're familiar with Vero Beach Turtle Trail, but it's at one of the wreck sites. And we would get in the water and we would walk way down to the south. It would take us about 30 minutes to get down there, um, about where the ballast pile of the shipwreck was. And we did that a few times. It was August, it was hot, you know, 90 degrees, and it was hard work to do that. And finally, I said, Chris, why don't we just go out right here where the boardwalk is and go out here and search. It's part of the wreck site. There's, there's beach markers, beach marker F and G. Let's search here, and Chris agreed to do that. And on that particular dive, I found a, a, a iron spike, which was my first artifact ever from the 1715 fleet. I found a cannon that nobody knew was that far north on the wreck site, but Chris did really good. Chris found that emerald ring right there. Um, that ended up selling years later, $139,000. Uh, we were using you know metal detectors and you can't get close to another person using a metal detector they start chattering they started interfering with each other so we had to kind of keep apart but i could hear his bubbles and i heard him yelling when he found that <laughs> i was that close to him um, that's mel's son kane fisher he found a bunch of gold at the rio mar wreck in vero beach in 1991. steven chupe found a bunch of treasure in 93. Um, this was the letter I was telling you about that Mel Fisher, uh, that uh, Bob Marks wrote to Mel Fisher on my behalf. I heard Bob speak at a, uh, at a presentation like I'm doing down in Palm Bay. And the next day I wrote him a letter asking him for a subcontract and he wrote to Mel and so Mel gave me the subcontract. So by 1992, I had my own subcontract. There's my card that they give you. Mel's company was called Cobb Point at the time. There's me shaking hands with Mel, signing the agreement. That's Taffy Fisher behind him. Uh, there's me and Bob Marks at one of the cookouts that was shortly before Bob died. There's me and Mel again at Vero Beach. There's some of the beautiful Kangsi porcelain that we find on the wreck sites. Um, that's my brother David holding two pieces of Kangsi that he found. Uh, 1993, this is at the cabin wreck. In Vero Beach, Bob Weller and Chris James, Chris was a guy that I started working with in 1993, they found this beautiful jewelry, eight feet of water. Just, Chris was out there swimming around with the metal detector, an old, old Garrett's metal detector. 
we found that those, you can't really tell, but those are diamonds in there. One had 170 diamonds, the other one had 150. Those are, are brooches. Uh, then the earrings are little pineapples. Um, they were calling them at the time Queen's Jewels, um, but I don't think they were the Queen's Jewels. We actually have a list somewhere of, of what the Queen's Jewels were, and there was nothing like that listed in there, but still an incredible find, just multi, multi million dollars, eight feet of water right off the cabin wreck. There's some more pictures of it. Um, 1996, I wrote an article for Lost Treasure Magazine about it. It was my very first article I wrote and I made the cover. I was very excited about that. Um, this is 1995, a treasure salver named Mike McGuire um, says he found that on the beach. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say any more than that. He found it on the beach. He gets to keep it all. It was very valuable. It's a solid gold box. I had a cru crucifix in there and some beautiful gold rings. Um, that's Steve Hancock. Look at all that treasure he's holding. He was very successful in the 1990s. Um, he also finds a lot of treasure on the beach, too. So just look at all these gold chains, gold rings. That's Steve right there. $600,000 won't change the lifestyle of Steve Hancock. Uh, that's me working the Virgil Lona. There's me with Mo Molinar working the Virgil Lona. We were there off of uh, Corrigan's Wreck in Vero Beach. There's my son, Danny. I had to get him in here. <laughs> um, so now we're to the, so we've gone chronologically. Now we're to the 21st century. We're in the year 2000. Sunken 1715 Spanish fleet still surrendering its riches. And um, there were a lot of people that thought by the year 2000 that the wrecks were worked out and you know there wasn't anything left to find, but boy, we're in for a surprise. There's 2003, John Wilson, another gold box at the cabin wreck. Look at that gold cross with emeralds in it. Again, he found that in about 10 feet of water um, right off of Kip's cabin. Um, there's a, a crew that I work for that's 2006. We went and bought a boat off of eBay. We all worked together at Port Canaveral, put it together, put some, you can see the blowers, they haven't even been used yet. Look how shiny they are. Um, we're getting ready to sail from uh, Cape Canaveral. We brought it down to uh, Sebastian and worked the 1715 fleet with that a few years. There's a pile of unclean silver coins. The reason they're green is because there is a small copper content in some of the coins. Maybe there were too much copper in these coins. That's what they look like. Um, Gloria, you were talking about how they conserved that artifact. That's a silver sword handle, and that's what it looked like when it came out of the water, and that's what it looks like after going through when it's properly conserved. They did a beautiful job conserving that. This is an interesting story. In 2010, Bonnie Schubert, the treasure salver, her only partner was her mom, Joe. Her mom, Joe, was in her 90s and was helping her pull lines. Joe didn't dive. <laughs> but she pulled lines and kept the log sheets and did all the, uh, on, the, on the boat. She found this gold artifact, again, off the gold wreck at Fort Pierce. Um, it's a Catholic religious object. It's called a pelican and piety. And it's the whole story of, of the pelican would, you know, tap its own beak to draw blood to feed its, to feed its babies. And uh, you can see how big that artifact was. It was beautiful, but it was missing one of the wings on it. Um, Bonnie got to keep that. I think she sold that for $800,000, but it was missing one of the wings. Look how beautiful that thing is. That's solid gold. There's another picture on it. There's her mom, Joe. So exactly 10 years later, so now we go from 2010 to 2020. And by the way, Bonnie looked for a long time for that missing wing. Another group went out there in that same area and they found the missing wing. Oh. When they plotted their coordinate of where they found it and compared it to where Bonnie found the bird 10 years earlier, it was six feet oh. from where she lost it. So um, it was really cool because they did, there it is as they found it. Um, so there it is, there's the wing reunited with that. Those are the tags that the state of Florida requires we tag our artifacts with. Um, whoever bought that, Artifact for $800,000 ended up buying the wing too. So they now have a complete artifact, but that's really cool that 10 years apart that they found that. Um, now we're coming to the year 2015, the 300th anniversary of the 1715 fleet sinking. And that's my friend Jonah. And 
on the anniversary day, you can't make some of this stuff up. The anniversary date is July 31st. On July 30th, they found 50 gold coins from the wreck site. On July 31st, they found 300 gold coins on the 300th anniversary of the fleet sinking to the day. So 350 gold coins in two days. And that's some of it right there. There's a pile of it right there. Uh, just unbelievable. And there he is, he's spelling out Capitana 300, 731, 15. So that's pretty cool. Look at those coins just stacked in piles. Really neat stuff. Big smiling Jonah. <laughs> um, these next three uh, pictures are interesting. You can see how close to the beach they're working. Some of the guys that have been more successful, and, and another reason why there's been a lot of treasure found in the last couple of years is in the earlier days, they tended to work out in deeper water where the ballast piles were. Most of the ballast piles were in about 18 feet of water. And so they tended to concentrate in the deeper water. And only recently, some of these guys have uh, figured out that, you know, when the ship sank, there were tons of ballast in the bottom of the ship, rocks that, that kept the ship, you know, from tipping over. And then all the silver coins were loaded on top of that. So when the ships hit the reef, the silver coins and the ballast dropped to the bottom right there. But the upper works of the ship and the stern castle where they kept all the, the gold treasure and the, the, the private treasure of individuals broke up and everything got washed to the beach. And they figured out that most of this stuff is still underneath the beach or in very, very shallow water. So these guys sort of worked in, in shallow water and have been very successful. You can see how close they are. They can actually jump off the, the beach and off the boat and, and they're on dry land practically. Back in the, in the 1980s, my friend Art Hartman tried the same thing. He backed his boat up to the beach like that. Um, he didn't even have divers in the water. He was so close to the beach. They were standing there on the beach and he's gunning the engines and he's digging a big hole and it's kicking silver coins up onto the beach and his divers are just picking them up. And pretty soon he had a crowd of people coming around to see what was going on. And all of a sudden it kicked up a clump of coins about the size of a football. And one of the bystanders there grabbed it, tucked it under his arm, and took off down the beach. <laughs> Nobody ever saw the guy again. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the guys that started working, look how close the shore is. That they started finding a lot of treasure. Um, you can see though the water is extremely flat. You can't do that if there's really any sort of a chop on the water. Um, you got to know the limits of your boat. Also, too, there are blowers in the water behind that boat. And I've worked in water that shallow. And, and when you get that shallow, they call the blowers cookie cutters because the boat moves up and down and those blowers start hitting the bottom and you're in the hole below those blowers. So you got to time it. So when the boat comes up on a wave, there's enough room for you to scoot out of the hole and get out of there before it comes back down again on top of you. Uh, there's my friend, Kim Farrell. I'm gonna go through these quickly. A lot of these are my friends. I just wanted to get him in here. That's Graham, look at that beautiful picture frame that he found at the cabin rack. Um, there's me, I think that's my, that's my 30th salvage season on the, on the 1750 fleet, 2021. Uh, that's Bill Black, that's the guy I work for. He runs Search and Salvage at Sebastian. Uh, he had a couple of boats, the one that he's on, he just sold recently, we're just down to one boat now. Bill runs the operation, he's a good guy. That's my friend Mary Ellen coming up with the clump of coins. You can actually see one of the coins right there. That's a big piece of eight right there. That was off the cabin wreck. You can tell it's a cabin wreck because look at that water. It's not very clear at all. And then there she is with a bunch of them as they're laid out on a towel. Some silver coins. Um, that's my friend Chris Tezak. I'm sorry, I don't know the diver on the left holding the gold coin. I wanted to include Chris in here. He just passed away about a week ago from cancer. Um, really sad. He was only in his he was only in his fifties, I think his mid fifties or so. So Chris was a long time, 1715 fleet treasure hunter. There's my friend Corinne. That's a picture I took of her, one of the cannons from the cabin wreck. You can see it right there. Uh, there's Mike Perna. He's a very successful treasure salver. Um, if you guys ever watched the show Cooper's, what was it called? Cooper's Treasures or Cooper's Gold, he was in that show. That was the astronaut, Gordon Cooper, that supposedly detected shipwrecks from space. And yeah. They had a show on for one. Um, this was just found, I believe this was found just a few weeks ago. That's Corinne. 
I think her name is Ashley. That's a uh, onion bottle, an intact onion bottle that they just found. You can see them wearing full wetsuits. I think there's a few of these guys are still out there working this year. Um, that was found on the Capitana with Greg Bounds. But there's Corinne and, and Ashley with a beautiful bottle. And there's Corinne with a beautiful gold ring that she found. That's the ring up there. And she's holding a piece of eight she just found. Very excited, obviously. Um, these next three slides, one of the things you have to remember, although we love these shipwrecks and we love going out there finding treasure and gold, um, you know, it was actually a, a disaster because 1,500 people died on those shipwrecks total. I mean, they were, they drowned, they were buried on the beach, they crawled up on the beach half alive. And so my friend on the left, Jim Wilson, a couple years ago, came out with this idea of the, he calls it the laying of the roses. So on July 31st of every year, he gets some volunteers and we drive down the Treasure Coast and go to every wreck site and we plant a rose on the beach. Um, and I came up with a prayer, uh, this was two years ago, and we say a prayer and we go to every site and we lay roses on there just as remembrance for the, the 1,500 people that died. There's Candy laying a rose on the beach. There's a prayer that I came up with that we read. And there's a nice shot of the rose, 1715. And then people always ask me, you know, what's the most important treasure or the best treasure, everything I found? You know, the real treasures are the friendships. Every year in uh, Wabasso at the Penwood Motor Lodge, Penwood Motor Lodge was a good choice because that's what brought Kip Wagner down here in the 50s. He was the contractor on that hotel. And every year they let us have a cookout. I think uh, this past year was the 12th year that they've had one. So we have one every year, it's open to the public historians, treasure hunters. Uh, we have this big cookout. In 2012, um, I was diagnosed with uh, stage three colon cancer. And they actually had a second cookout that year for me. And they raised over $10,000 for me, helped me pay a lot of my medical bills. Um, John Redmond started that. Um, he actually started at his house in Orlando. I think the first two years we had it at his house and it got to be too many people. So we found this site, Sebastian. So, if you all ever, I think every April we have it. I think it's the last Saturday in April. If you're in the area, we have this great cookout. It's free. We ask for a donation though, you know, bring something to eat, but um, that's it. That concludes my presentation. Go on. When you find something not on the beach, what? how do you make money from that? When it's not on the beach? Yeah, you have a license with the state, so they're well, going to share, but what, what is your take on that then? We're working as subcontractors. Now, first of all, there is a group that, that has the rights to these wrecks. It's called Queens Jewels LLC. And they were named the federal custodians of the wrecks. Originally, Mel Fisher was. So the Mel Fisher family is not involved at all in any of the Treasure Coast wrecks. They sold the rights to that in 2010 to a guy named William Brisbane, who was a millionaire, billionaire living on Jupiter Island. And William bought him for his son, Brent. I guess his son was bored and gave him some shipwrecks to <laughs> play on for a while. And then the Brisbane sold it to the current group. So they have the rights to them. So we're working as subcontractors. So as subcontractors, we get 50% of whatever we find. However, the state of Florida, because we're working in Florida waters, the state of Florida can take up to 20% of whatever we find right off the top of the list they get first pick they don't always take 20 percent. sometimes they don't take anything at all um, they they're past the point really to where they're interested in treasure they're more interested in unique artifacts so you, you're going to get anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of what you find oh, right. now if you're working by yourself great you get to keep it but if you're not working by yourself you got divers you got investors you know nobody's getting rich off of these wrecks Really? Yeah. Boat, boats operate cheap too, right? That's right. Yeah. Well, Diesel fuel is expensive, and all that beautiful jewelry and the rings. Why were they on the ships? I mean, they're coming to the New World. They're not going to sell them to the Aztecs or something like. A that. lot of that was just the personal wealth of, of passengers. One thing back then is gold was taxed. If you brought it, in, if you were bringing gold back from the the New World, in like bullion form or a bar, you were taxed on that. I have a, a replica of a gold bar here and. There's tax stamps on them. If it was jewelry, you weren't taxed on that. So a lot of people, that's why you see all the gold chains, they brought it back in the form of jewelry. 
you can make it into gold chains, gold jewelry, and you weren't taxed. But a lot of that is just wealthy passengers. Oh, I thought it was just treasure. I mean, it's just people sailing for the queen to find treasure or spices. Yeah. Okay. Wasn't right. that made in the New World, those intricate uh, rosaries and things? Weren't they made here? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were made in the, in the New World. Um, actually, by the 1700s in, in, uh, in Mexico, they had brought artisans in from the Philippines or from China. In fact, I showed you that gold plate that my friend Alex found that every, everybody thought was from one of the Manila gallons. But he found out that there were actually um, Chinese artisans in Mexico at the time. And it m might have been made in Mexico. But yeah, all this stuff was, was made here in the New World. And, and Cartagena and uh, Veracruz and Havana. Yeah. Did you hear about this morning on the news they um talked about a Spanish ship found off the coast of Colombia and it had $20 billion. So that is the, that shipwreck's called the San Jose. That actually figures into the 1750 fleet because as the war was going on, Spain needed money badly. They needed these fleets to come back with, with all this bullion and gold. In 1708, the Spanish fleet was attacked off of Cartagena, Colombia, and the San Jose went down. Um, that's the one that you're talking about. And then in 1711, another Spanish fleet sunk off of uh, Cuba. So Spain needed this money from 1715 fleet bad. And when it, it sunk, it almost uh, ruined their economy, not just in Spain, but throughout Europe. I mean, all this, all this money, uh, uh, you know, is what made everything flow. So yeah, and you're right. They're saying that thing is worth billions of dollars. If yeah. you've ever seen pictures of it, it's in water too deep for anyone to dive on. I think it's thousands of feet deep but there's just bronze cannons laying on the seafloor. There's thousands of pieces of the, that Kang Sea China. You can see gold coins laying on the bottom. Columbia wants to try and salvage that before the current president leaves office in 2026. Um, but Spain is disputing it. There's actually an American company that says that they found it, they're disputing it. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Is there anybody trying to find the one that you think is off the coast of uh, Martin County? Um, I've heard and seen like some divers out there at one point around the House of Refuge. I don't know if that's there the was same a group that or, worked out there a few years ago looking yeah. for that. Now again, we don't we don't know where it's at, but they believe it's right. somewhere <coughs> in this area. Um, you may have heard of a guy named Dave Jordan. Dave Jordan said that he found a bunch of cannons off of Tiger Shores Beach. Okay. He's been looking for a wreck there. Um, Jonah Martinez, who found those 300 gold coins, he's been down here looking with the group. Um, back in the 1960s, Expeditions Unlimited and, and Norm Scott, they looked down there off of uh, Rand's Pier, which is oh, yeah. south of the House of Refuge. Yeah. They've been looking down here. The Martin County Historical Society um, has oh, been wow, looking down here too. Yeah. yeah. And it could be something as simple as, you know, when they when they dredged the inlet, you know, they, they destroyed the... Um, yeah. The, the wreck site. Um, there have been a lot of things found off of Pex Lake. I can tell you this, I have talked to friends who have found coins there from the 1715 era. I have a friend that found a, a beautiful emerald ring off of there. Um, that's an interesting area from the inlet south to around Pex Lake, even a little bit south of there. Um, so who knows? Yeah. So when's the best time to like walk the beach after a big hurricane? <laughs> <laughs> after a big hurricane or after a nor'easter. Um, unfortunately, I could spend a whole another hour talking about beach renourishment. I am not a fan of it. Um, they do it down there where I live in Jupiter. Um, they actually put so much sand on the beach. There was a, a near shore reef. It had worm rock and it had reef and there were fish in there and they made the beach so wide that they obliterated this entire reef um even further south off of jupiter beach there was a uh, an artifact called a capstan off of a, a steamship from the 1870s it was in four feet of water it was sitting on the bottom and you could snorkel over it It was a beautiful artifact take pictures of it i had pictures of us snorkeling over it and i gps the location of it i know exactly where it is the state County, whatever, did a beach renourishment project there and they made the beach really wide. So out of curiosity, I got my GPS unit and I went back looking for that. Instead of being 80 feet offshore and four feet of water, it was now literally in the middle of the beach under about six feet of sand. I stuck a, a stick in the sand marking the spot and I stood back and looked 
and it was nowhere near the shore anymore. And uh, so I'm not a big fan of beach nourishment. It keeps hiding these artifacts that we're looking for. Um, but after a hurricane or a, or a nor'easter, that's the best time to look. I want to find that gold chain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dry land. Dry land. I don't go out in the water. Yeah. And if you find it on the beach, it's yours to keep. Um, there's different ways to do that. A lot of these guys do it privately. Um, there's a guy named Dan Sedwick who has these auctions every year. He's a very famous guy. He lives in, in Winter Park. His dad, Frank Sedwick, um, they were coin experts, but they started doing these auctions. And they buy a lot of these coins directly from the treasure hunters and auction them off. Um, but it's not hard to find. Do they do it on their shop? What's that? Do they do it online or do they do it through a... They do, they do it online, yeah. It's like, a, it's like a live auction. But most of these guys don't have any trouble finding it. Um, just be aware, though, there's a lot of counterfeit stuff out there. I would never buy anything from eBay or, or any of these online. There's a lot of, uh, you'll see it online now for 17, 15 emeralds. 90% of that stuff is fraud. Anybody can buy an emerald and say they found it um, on the shipwreck. There's been very few emeralds found on the 1715 fleet, especially loose emeralds. Most of them are, are in the jewelry and the rings, but there's a lot of uh, scrupulous people that are, are selling these things. Uh, if you buy, try and buy it directly from one of the sellers, you know, or somebody that's connected to it, you should get a nice certificate of authenticity um, with it that shows you the provenience of it, who found it, where it was found. Contractors, you give everything to the, right? When you take 50% your company then, you that, Right, yeah, yeah. I don't know what Queen's Jewels, you know, they get half of, I don't know what they do with their percentage, and you know, I'm not worried about that, but yeah. Some of it, most of the stuff that I found, I haven't sold, it's, you know, it's gonna go to my kids. Um, I love the artifacts. I like finding the artifacts as much as I like finding the, yeah. The, you know the coins the treasure and I just don't do shipwreck stuff I was telling Gloria I, over the years I've been diving up in the Loxahatchee River in Jupiter I found thousands of old bottles and um, Indian pottery that's thousands of years old I found woolly mammoth teeth that are 10,000 years old and I just like being in the water you know looking for history so and like I said I, I usually don't sell any of my stuff Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.